Wednesday, it's Rog, and what have we just seen? Manchester City obliterating Aston Villa, Arsenal rolling over Little Luton, uh, and all of that obviously in the shadow. The big story, the whole of world football is talking about Everton didn't lose. And Dominic Calvin actually scored a big boy goal. I will talk about all of this and more. Don't know if you've noticed, I'm out in the wild. I'm broadcasting live from Soccer.com World Headquarters in Hillsborough, North Carolina. Here's some proof. There's a goalkeeper glove. I actually just ate some of the best brisket of my year at the Hillsborough Barbecue Company. Uh, but let's football it up. It is incredible to break down everything that's happened tonight and yesterday with you, for you, by you, with the chief soccer correspondent of your New York Times. I like to think of him as DJ Burns Jr. of football podcasting. It's my friend, oh, Mr. Rory Smith. Evening. Oh, Rory, what an evening. What a time it is to be alive. Um, sandwiched in between Everton not losing and Liverpool probably winning tomorrow. But Rory is not the only one who will be joining us tonight. You can too, dear GFOP. Come up right now. Ask us questions about football or life oh, or barbecue brisket. Here's how. Just scan that QR code in the top left of your screen. It'll take you into a Zoom with our producer, Jake, a beautiful human being who will get you set up to ask your question. Come be with me. Come be with Raw. It's audio only. So you don't have to put your shirt on. Do not be afraid. We'll get to your questions in one moment. But get in line right now to make sure you get yours in there. And if your question or comment can't wait, get in the chat, which we'll be reading throughout the show. Um, And get the likes in. Click the like with the little thumbs up at the bottom of the screen. Come be with us. Let's feast on the football, starting with a toast. I want to raise my third first Michelob Ultra of the day to the championship title race, the most brutally competitive league in the world, even by its high standards, is going next level madhouse. Championship, it owns Easter Monday. And what a day, tiny Ipswich town, historically rich, team who once dazzled in the late 1970s and early 1980s under iconic English manager Bobby Robson when they twice finished runners-up in the old first tier Division 1. They won the FA Cup. They also won the Europa League predecessor, the UEFA Cup. Um, have been restored to the cusp of glory by new American owners, team led by one of the youngest, most coveted managers in English football, Kieran McKenna. So tactically savvy. Um, and have retained their place as the league leaders following a 97th minute winner against Southampton. Leeds United, Leicester City still in the hunt for the automatics after their respective wins. Um, five other teams Uh, looking to chase them for a place in the playoffs. Premier League is a blessing, as we will discuss. But the championship, both the promotion end and the relegation darkness, really the one to keep both eyes on. Raw, you are on, you're at Leeds Curious in terms of where you live. What is the, what's the energy? What's the hope? What's the, what's the vibe? Yeah, I, was, I had to explain to my son the other day that while we don't actively support Leeds, we do, we do want them to win every game they play other than two. That's our approach to, Liverpool, to, to Leeds and to Liverpool. That you know, the, the only time we want Leeds to lose is when they're playing Liverpool. He's, he's, he's old enough now to understand this concept. Yeah, it's... it's, it's You're very, by the way, I'll say this again. You're a very good parent. It's, it's good it's, parenting. It's, I want him to have a rich, full kind of... I, I support loads of different teams. I have lots of different affections for lots of different teams. And I think it's really important you do. It's something that the English people generally get quite upset about, <laughs> partic- particularly when Americans do it. But I think it's completely normal to have a team in, obviously a team that you support, a team that you love, but then teams in different countries that you're fond of. We've had someone in the chat already saying, you know, saying that Fortuna Dusseldorf are their German team. Why would Fortuna Dusseldorf be your German team? There is, there is no not? reason for that. Is the answer. But it's, Why it's, not? It's wonderful that that's the case. And yeah, I'm trying to bring him up to to obviously have a big team, you know, a team that he supports, a team that is is at the centre of his being, but to kind of take solace and to follow the rich tapestry of football. In answer to your question, it's nervy, I think. There, there were four teams in the hunt. There was Leicester, who around kind of Christmas looked like they were gone. They were, they were flying 12, 15 points clear. And then Ipswich, Leeds and Southampton have all been really close. 
at, f- at various points. Southampton, who are an excellent football team, have fallen away just a little bit. It was them that, that Ipswich beat last uh, last Monday. And that kind of maybe just about does for their automatic promotion hopes. But Ipswich are fantastic, Leeds are fantastic, and Southampton are really good. And the shame of it is that one of them, at least, maybe two, won't go up this season. And I think you can make a case that all of them warrant a place in the Premier League. Uh, the, God the, bless. The, the solace for the one that does not make it is that at least you'll play Everton home and away next season. So there's always there's always to, clouds to silver linings. To be fair, the one thing I would say is that whoever doesn't go up has got a decent chance of going up next season because at least two of the three teams who are coming down don't look like, don't look like they're in great shape. But the impact on the Premier League next season is is pretty important too because Leicester looked really good, Ipswich looked good, Leeds looked good, Southampton looked good. Those are not teams who are going to come up and be Sheffield United or Burnley. They are going to, I, I, they're going to be aiming I, for 15. I, 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 I'm already living one relegation hell. Do not make me start crapping my pants about next year's. Um, but let's get into the Premier League feast of this evening, which is honestly up there with the brisket that I had for lunch. I'm not going to lie. Let's start at the top with the game that just finished. Manchester City 4, Aston Villa 1. Um, back to the Etihad, where we last saw Manchester City vaguely wounded in their sense of self being held by Arsenal. Held for the first time at home in 58 games, which is a remarkable statistic. Uh, Pep Guardiola having to act as slightly fractious peacekeeper between an uber-frustrated Haaland and Gabriel that was essentially, and I'm only vaguely exaggerating, uh, something that happened after he'd publicly flayed Jack Grealish, humiliating him with a long, angry dressing down post-final whistle. A lot of English commentators were like, Jack was not listening to a word. You can see exactly when his eyes glazed over. Jack was listening to everything, and it was kind of awful and painful to watch. And I do want to talk about that very quickly for one second raw because everything Pep Guardiola does is calculated, you know, designed to send a signal. Not it's nothing is improv. What do you make of his decision to crap on DJ Grills before the eyes of the world after that? Was that designed to send a signal to Jack himself, to the rest of the players, or, or to the viewing public? Well, how much of it Jack Grealish has taken in, I think, is probably best gauged by the fact that, that you might have seen, you've seen the video of Jack Grealish doing a quiz in which he's asked to identify where Birmingham is, the city that he was born in. He's shown this big map of England, of Britain, and he's asked to identify where Birmingham is. And he he is surprised to find out that it, it is, in fact, a map of Britain. He can't fully <laughs> identify England. I'm what not is that? sure. I think Jack Grealish might be a kinesthetic learner. I know that's my <laughs> overall view. The, so, so how much like deep, like deep rooted tactical stuff he's taking in while he's like sweating and panting and breathing heavily after a really difficult football match? You, you, I don't you, think, know. you think the lot got it? So, so Pep would know that. By the way, John Oliver came on on our show, came up with the rather delicious theory. He thinks Jack Grealish is like Tom Hanks in Big, is a child trapped in a grown up's body. And he's like just walking around the world, just be like, Ooh, my legs are all hairy. How did that happen? Um, but he's also deliriously good at football because of the physical gifts that he does have. But I love that theory that Jack is just a seven-year-old hanging out. Oh, Holland's a big lad. He's a big boy, isn't he? Um, but why did Pep do it? So he he does it quite a lot. And he was asked about it before the in the, the press conference before the game. So Tuesday it would have been. And he, he did that typical Guardiola thing of the sarcastic response, sort of saying, oh, it's all, it's all about my ego. I do it so that... I'm the centre of attention. And I actually think, in a way, that's a very Guardiola response, because he's assuming, and this sounds really bad, but he's assuming it's about him. Whereas a lot of the reaction is, look, this is quite embarrassing for the players. And it's Grealish isn't the only one he's done it to. He does it reason, reasonably frequently, more frequently than most managers. I think on one level, it is just that that's what's in his head. He wants to get the message into the players as quickly as possible, while... While the kind of the, the whatever mistake they've made, whichever kind of slight tactical or technical faux pas they've committed is, is fresh in their minds, because he feels that's the most effective way of doing it. But I've got to admit, and it's it's hard to criticize any aspect of Guardiola's management. I'm not sure it's brilliant man management because Guardiola might think it's ridiculous that people interpret it as being for the cameras, but the players will be very conscious that they are being filmed. Because when you look at those shots, 
you know, we see them, we see that these broad images that are, are, seem like they're kind of not being filmed from afar, but you don't necessarily realize how close the cameras are to the players' faces. They are right in their faces. It's they are true. right and, next and, to and, them. And that was one of the crazy things about that interaction, Raw, was that they didn't know for a second footballers are only meant to speak with their hands across their mouth like that. Yeah. There was a lot of unguarded. I was horrified. Like, I'm so now used to the post game, there's just a lot of grown men speaking with hand across the mouth. I was like shouting, Oh my God, Pep, for the love of God, what are you doing speaking words where lit readers can tell us what they are? But I do love your idea of a kinesthetic learner, which is just a nice way of saying that Jack Grealish likes to play tag. And Pep continued his mind games going into this one, declaring the title was, quote, not in our hands. All we can do is think of Aston Villa. If you're top of the league, like we've been before, you are the favourites. He also knew his team hadn't beaten a top five opponent all season. Villa had actually won the reverse fixture. And from the off here, Villa player like Unai Emery had been watching Arsenal Sunday performance over and over and over. I like to think of Unai Emery only watching games on Betamax videotapes, just watching, dropping the bank of five across the back. And what we know is to do that takes total concentration against this City team, total focus. Um, and Villa did not have that. On 11 minutes, Foden fed a speeding Doku um, who rolled the ball back to Rodri. Uh, I think in the, the commentator said he lifted the ball into that. He, he obliterated the ball into that, a goal which proved, honestly, you that goal was both a goal in this game, but it made you even revere what Arsenal did for 90 minutes last Sunday. You know, their ability to devote total focus with no slips, no mistakes on Sunday. That's what this goal uh, kind of revealed to me. Um, it was it was like it's hard to do, bloody hard. Very few teams could do what Arsenal did last Sunday. Yeah, and th those first 10 15 minutes, Villa looked. Like they were on the ropes a little bit. They looked like they were they were they were reeling because just because City keep coming, they keep asking questions, they keep working angles, they keep kind of finding lanes, finding space, sort of Jimmy in open a defense. And the, look, Villa had a weakened team out. They've you know the Ollie Watkins is injured, John McGinn suspended, Kamara's out for the season, Jacob Ramsey wasn't there. You know, they were short of players. Pau Torres wasn't fit enough to start. Emmy Martinez wasn't in goal. You know, that's a fairly big, a fairly big miss as well. But they've got a decent squad villa. They've had a great season. And City did look like they could cut through them at any moment. And when the goal came, it was the second or third time, really, that you'd thought, oh, Villa are really playing with fire here. They're gonna they're gonna get caught, or they look like they're they're hanging on for dear life. So it wasn't a shock. The the smoothness of the finish is very Rodri. That he has an amazing ability just to do that. Get that sort of power, that sort of lift first time is is remarkably difficult on the move. But it felt, even after, what, 11 minutes, it felt pretty inevitable. Yeah, I was watching with a City fan and she fell outraged quite beautifully. She said, oh, it's been so long since I've been able to enjoy <laughs> a City goal. Um, and it felt like that would be that. Um, but credit Villa. The goal kind of sprung them into life to prove that they were there for more than to just give their fans an opportunity to boo Jack Grealish relentlessly. Um, and suddenly they broke from the edge of their own area. Julian Alvarez dispossessed. Chicago fire in exile. Duran and Rodgers exchanged passes. Uh, and Duran charged onto that ball to finish wickedly uh, past Ortega. Um, you know, that was their only Ollie Watkinless shot of the first half on target, uh, but it was magnificent. A goal that could be subtitled How to Win Friends and Influence People in Liverpool and North London by Johnny Duran. 1 1 City, always vulnerable to a ball in behind. I actually spoke to Ruben Diaz uh, earlier this week uh, in an interview that's going to drop imminently, and I asked him, I was like, God, it's hard being you to like just constantly live in fear of being you know exposed in behind. Um, and I said to him, what do you think in your head when that happens? And he thought for a minute, so I just joked. I was like, do you think of two words? Kyle Walker's got it. Um, and he laughed. Uh, but Kyle injured, as he will be uh, against Real Madrid. I mean, that was goal was just a reminder what an enormous miss he is for, as always, uh, what you call here a, lock, uh, a lockdown cornerback. Um, without him, there is an added vulnerability. Yeah, and do you know what? This this sounds silly in retrospect, given given obviously how the game went. But I thought that first half, Villa on the on the on the counter, what we now have to call transition, looked really <laughs> looked really dangerous. 
pretty much every time they were attacking with three or four players, not huge numbers committed going forward, but a reasonable reasonable number. That they weren't kind of leaving it to one, you know, to Duran and Rogers to see what they could do. There was there was clearly a plan not to leave themselves exposed at the back, but to get enough forward to pose a threat. And they did it three or four times in the first half, particularly just after the goal, in fact. They they had two or three attacks that you thought, look, City obviously are dominating the ball. They're, they're you know, horseshoeing around the Villa box like City do. But it did look like if, if Villa could break that first line of the press, that there was space there for them to exploit. And at that point, you thought going into just, just as halftime sort of hovered into view you thought this game's actually in the balance like Villa have, are clearly they've got a plan they know how to execute it they're a good team they might be weakened but they know what they're doing and they've got a way of hurting Manchester City and that I think obviously this evening didn't make any difference but it's something that maybe Guardiola will have to have a little bit of an eye on ahead of Real Madrid in particular because if you give Real Madrid chance to counter-attack oh they will hurt God. you. At warp speed at warp speed doctor Spock, but the um, I mean, that is fine. I love that idea that City horseshoe the ball around the box, Jack Grealish. What's a horseshoe? Um, but City did work back into what's a horse, (laughs) yeah. To explain that to you, Jack, we're going to explain what a horse is, sir. Um, stay with me here. There's a thing called animals. Um, City word back into life, lots of ball, very little final ball. Doku, really, the personification, um off their performance in that first half, searing talent, undoubted. Uh, his first touch, exquisite. The way his explosive first step. Uh, either way, uh, just a ball mastery until it comes to crossing it um, when you just couldn't hit the side of a Manchester bus. Stroke a half time, free kick on the edge of the Villa area. Um, God bless Phil Foden, struck it right at the wall. Um, but it was either intentional or just poorly hit. It didn't matter. Zaniolo, God bless him, turned his back. All I can, the only way I can describe it is like one of those uh, inflatable wavy arm garage tube men ushering the ball right past him. An agony for Villa, really, uh, into the Villa net. A remarkable moment of an elite footballer almost acting like a civilian there, Rook. Yeah, you don't actually see that happen that often. It's, it is funny, though, the, the thin line between kind of brilliant free kick and awful free kick. Does that? I, I don't think that was on purpose. I don't, I don't think Foden was seeking a gap. I don't think he'd thought, do you know what, Nic- Nicola Zaniolo is mentally <laughs> slightly I've weak. Seen, I've seen something on film, lads. Yeah, Zaniolo we did, we, don't like it. We did a 20-minute analysis session on how Nicola Zaniolo jumps, and we've decided that's the weak spot. No, I think the wall broke, which does happen. It happens occasionally. You, you don't actually see it very often anymore. But it used to happen in the olden days when football was rubbish. Uh it's it's a really amateurish mistake. I think the funny thing is, yeah, that goal looks wonderful, especially Olsen's reaction, you know, sort of going down to his knees as if there's nothing, nothing he can do to resist the kind of will of fate. But if Zaniolo doesn't jump away, if he just jumps up, it just hits the wall, and it's actually quite a it's quite a poor free kick. Yes, but then that's the I suppose that's the thing with that's maybe why Douglas Louise, you don't commit slightly unnecessary fouls outside the area. Oh, got Olsen probably at half time going up to Zaniolo. But aren't we all just powerless uh, in the, against the will of fate? I just love that phrasing. Yes. Why are we even playing football? It's all predetermined. Uh, by the way, I was actually at Villa. Um, the last time I was there, um, I was at watching them train. John Terry was then their assistant manager. And he spent the whole time. Uh, the time he had with the team, just blasting the ball himself at his defenders, um, at their body parts, just screaming, we take the ball in the face! We take the ball! Just like training them to put their arms behind their back so there could be no handball, but just use any part of their body, you know, their face, their undercarriage, whatever, to both stop the ball and like it. Zaniolo, I laughed when I watched that training. It seems so unbelievably sadistic. Um, but Sandy Ullin, he's clearly needs that training. Get John Terry back. We'll fix that one up. No problem. Um, second half, City made the Villa. We take it in the face. Uh, City made the Villa backline buckle, uh, looking for the kill shot. But Robin Olsen in the Villa goal, honestly played like Merlin Olsen, swatted shot after shot with his Swedish paws of justice. Um, but then um, Phil Foden just stepped up and scored one of those goals that you know is going to be a goal, not even be- before he strikes it, you know it's going to be a goal when the ball's rolled across the box. 
because the ball is ball is rolled towards one Phil Foden. Um, not many people in the world of football finish like that. What he did, just computing the angle, the precision, the velocity to pass the ball, stun shot into the net first time. I mean, who's on that list for you, Roy? It's a tiny list. Phil Foden, Lionel Messi, Dominic Calvert-Lewin. That's it for me. Yeah, Tony Hibbert. Uh, there's, there's, there's not many. So Salah obviously is a brilliant finisher, but he's he's not as he's not as neat a finisher as Foden. I think that's probably fair to say. Same with Haaland. Haaland tends to Haaland's got lots of lots of different types of finish, but they tend to be more powerful. Whereas there's a precision to Foden. The thing that struck there is, a, I think, there is now emerging like a defined Foden finish. There is a style of striking the ball that is distinctly his, you can tell a Phil Foden goal, even if you can't see the faces and the numbers and the kits involved. Like, you know the type of finish that he produces. And although his second and third goals are really, like, visually different, there's there's not, apart from the fact he hits both with, with his left foot, they're both struck in the same way, that it's the economy of movement, the little backlift, the fact that he gets quite a lot of power but also just the extreme placement. There's a lot of whip. There's a lot of kind of... There's an arrow quality to the ball, I guess, that that he he shouldn't really be able to get with the way that he's striking the ball. But I guess it's just to do with basically perfect technique. But I just want to... I want to pick up on something that John Helzer said in the comments uh, about walls. Does Rod, you'll be delighted to know I've got a theory about walls. Please give me Rory Smith's theory on walls. Pre-proceed. So it's, it's not actually mine. It's my dad's. So, and it's one. My dad. My dad is not a man who believes in many things. He doesn't believe in any of the big questions in life. He's he is he's atheistic and agnostic in every possible way. But if he does believe anything, it's this, and that's that. If the defending team didn't build a wall, the attacking team would, because he thinks that in most situations the presence of the wall is actually a negative for the defending team because it disguises, it hides the ball from the goalkeeper. His He thinks that Premier League level, most goalkeepers presented with a shot more than about 23 yards out would back themselves to save it if it was, you know, if they could see what was happening. And I do wonder, certainly with that Foden, with Foden's first goal, also wonderfully struck, uh, although too low and actually quite a bad free kick, Robin Olsen would have saved that really quite easily if he'd seen it. But because the wall's in the way, he doesn't. So my dad's theory is that you should never have a wall unless the ball is, let's say, 25, less than 25 yards from the goal. If it's any further further out than that, don't have a wall. That's the, the hill. That, that's the hill your dad wants to die on. He will absolutely die on that hill. He's adamant about it. And I've got to admit, <laughs> over the course of, obviously, I've known him for a long time. Yeah. But you know, he's repeated it to me many times because he's, he's at the age where. You know, yeah, yeah. there's only yeah. You run out, they, you run out of things to say. You've they, not had they, a new thought in about 25 years. They start to they start to repeat the same things again and, well, again, and, and by, again. By 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 there you mean me too. I'm in that category. Yeah, me, um, too, me as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I, lo I love your dad. Um, and I want to meet him. I mean, I just imagine this man walking around saying, "I don't believe in God. I don't believe in love. I don't believe." Uh, in forgiveness, but I do believe, believe that those, outside of 23 yards, you shouldn't have a bloody yeah. wall, which is actually very, very interesting. And if there's any elite goalkeepers out there, because I've spoken to a lot of goalkeepers about this very issue, uh, and there are some situations where the uh, offensive team do make their own little wall mm -hmm. to shield the uh, the intent uh, from the kind of distance that Mr. Smith uh, actually hints about. So elite goalkeepers, oh, come be with us. I'm going to get a goalkeeper on with you and me. We can talk about this. Uh, in depth, raw, but in all honesty, um, by the way, Foden, as you mentioned, would get his hat trick seven minutes later, uh, regaining yeah. possession on the edge of his area, just lash thrash bashing it home past a truly thing at this point, just a uh, shocked and shell shocked Olsen. Um, I hate Phil Foden's celebration. I need to mention this is his mm. trademark guns. Um, at Michael Engstrom 4955 says, Rog, they're not guns, they're Foden's loaded jazz hands, which I do love. <laughs> they're not guns, they're loaded jazz hands. I love that concept. Thank you, Michael Engstrom. Send us an email with your postal address, and I'll thank you in person for that beautiful concept. I do want to touch upon this talking about Foden, Raw. The kids City bring through Foden. Rico Lewis, even Oscar Bob, uh, we've seen in his brief cameos. There's something about the mentality that they ingrain in that youth academy 
Um, there's a ruthlessness. There's a steel that you just don't get en masse from other academies. I think Phil Foden calls it different gravy. Um, it's teens who appear to have no self-doubt or vulnerability. And I'm saying that as someone who's 80% self-doubt or vulnerability. It's incredible what they're doing. Yeah, well, so the first thing is the quantity. Morden Rogers, who was playing for Villa, they signed him from January, from Middlesbrough in January. He's a City kid. City did take him from West Brom as a 14-year-old or something. But the number of players who you see coming through at other clubs now and you, you realise that at some point in their development they were at Manchester City is genuinely remarkable. That's partly to the way they've kind of recruited. They've been really active in in hoovering up effectively the, the most <laughs> talented players in their age groups from teams across England. There's the, the, the youth system, EPPPP, PPP, PPP, allows them to do that. It's vaguely controversial. It's not vaguely controversial. It is quite controversial. There is a logic behind it, but it is without question. It favours the big clubs. Um, City have done that very well. Obviously, most of them don't make it to the Man City team. Plenty of them go on to play in the Premier League or the Championship or, or elsewhere in Europe. So there is a quantity there that they're churning out. But yeah, you're right. There's, there's there's a sort of, there's an unfazedness to the kids that City produce who make it to the team. And I guess that's probably a function partly of having had expert coaching, the best in the world, since a very young age. It's partly because they will know their job in that team to within an, within an inch of their lives, because they are being brought in and given very specific instructions uh, I think it's probably testament to the culture that Guardiola, as well as the other people, have created. You know, the people in the football executive have created, um, and it's their talent. They they will know that if you're making it to the Man City first team as a eight, 17, 18, 19 year old, you're probably pretty good. So there's not really any reason to have any self doubt. I mean, there's something about the mentality, though, like just the complete and utter confidence. Is, I mean, by the way, Liverpool are probably uh, coming closest um, um, in that regard. But something about the mentality where there's utterly no self-doubt, there's no sense mm. of uh, of lessness. It's really, I mean, it's genuine. I was someone that watched Dominic Calvert-Lewin, for instance, run on a lot for Everton as a kid. He's just in a puddle of his own self-confidence. And it took a while. I know we're laughing now, uh, but Dominic Calvert-Lewin became a very potent striker under Ancelotti. Um, it took time. It, t- it does take time, that jump from the youth team into the first team. City's players, they're like, there was a kid I used to play rugby with um, and someone went up to him one day. Uh, he joined the school late. He was a new kid and said, you think you're great. He was very cocky. And he goes, I don't think I'm great. I know I am. Um, and I do think about him when I watch Phil Foden play football. He's just it- that good. The other thing that's that, that's related to this, I think, is so I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday about Lewis Dunk at Brighton. And Lewis Dunk is in his early 30s <laughs> now. He's 31, 32. And he's turned into a really cultured, really in, inventive centre-back, as as lots of centre-backs are now. You know, he's not a kind of old-fashioned English clogger anymore, or if he ever was. he You know, he plays balls through the lines. He clips little passes here and there. He does Cruyff turns in the box to get out of trouble. And I think that is because he has been coached in his latter years by people like Roberto De Zerbi and Graham Potter, who've encouraged him, who've said, look, you're really good at football. This is how you can play. Let's let's do this. Let's work out how we can express your talent, even in a position where you're not generally meant to express talent. You're meant to express passion and desire and intensity, but not talent. And my, my mate was saying that it'd be interesting to know whether Lewis Dunk, has some sort of regret that he didn't have coaches like that earlier in his career. It's fascinating. Phil, Phil Foden has only ever had coaches like that. It's amazing. He's never had anything it, else. And that's why know, there is that confidence. Dunk was the guy who said about De Zerbe, he said, he has taught me things about football, thinking about basic fundamentals of football that I didn't even think about. I mean, bit, the City kids are getting that at their early formations and it's just genuinely, um, I mean, it's just, oof, I mean, they are just chess grandmasters almost out of the womb great night for city and for spurs uh, and their cold difference um I, I mentioned this 87 times now i did speak to diaz i uh, i asked him what city have that sets him apart from other teams that gives him confidence in his title challenge uh, he said it's the ability to suffer more than their opponents, which I find really fascinating. But all that Pep can do now, as he joked pre-game, is to support Manchester United, as he always does whenever they play Liverpool. 
he and his beloved Julia Roberts united in heart and mind for one weekend anyway. To North London, Arsenal 2, Luton 0. How would you follow up one of the most defiant, organised, relentless, punishing performances of the campaign last Sunday at Manchester City with, with a switch up of talent, Saka and Rice given a night off? Um, as starters with the games coming fast and furious, part A in Smith Rowe given first start since January. Reese Nelson handed his first Premier League start since July 2020, 1,358 days ago. Um, the Times actually had a very prescient piece this morning asking this roar. The headline was Arteta's conundrum how to rotate without disrupting the team. He actually really has a, it favours a very small number of players mm. within that squad. Yeah, it's true of City as well, actually. Their squads aren't aren't quite as extensive as you maybe think they are. And Arteta has been quite reliant on certainly like a core of the team basically being unchanging. And he'll I'm sure he'll be conscious on some level that last season, Arsenal kind of fell away when Saliba got injured. That seemed to rip... Not the soul out of the team, but it, it definitely interrupted their balance a little bit. And he'll he'll not want to do that. But the challenge for Arsenal, and look, it was Luton tonight, and Luton have been really impressive all season. They're really game. They worked really hard. They are they've learned and learned and learned over the course of of their first season in the Premier League. And there is still a chance they will stay up. But Arsenal would be expected to beat them and beat them comfortably. Um but the challenge for Arteta now is he's got he doesn't have a, a midweek off, as far as I'm aware for the rest of, for the, certainly for April and possibly into May, depending on how they're doing the Champions League. He's going to have to find a way to make sure he doesn't get those those players he relies on into what Arsene Wenger used to call the red zone. And just once they're there, then then sort of <laughs> the, the risk of injury becomes so great that if you lose, you know, if you miss William Saliba for a couple of games, you might be all right. But if you lose Saliba for the rest of the season, you've got a real problem. And Arteta hasn't necessarily had to face that particularly intensively just yet. They got through the Champions League group group stage with with relative ease. They got knocked out of the FA Cup early. They didn't, you know, they didn't go far, didn't go deep in the Carabao. So he's he's had a, a slightly easier schedule than Liverpool yeah. and, and City so far. So that's about that's to flip. the big challenge. Yeah. Awesome Wenger's red zone. Awesome Wenger's red zone sounds like the second best nightclub in Montpellier. And I'm <laughs> really I love that the, the, idea. There is a slight element of late night German TV show about it as well. Yeah, there is. You mean slightly yeah. soft porn? Like, what's this yeah, thing yeah. on the television? Oh, it's just Arsene Wenger's red zone. Um, in the early exchanges, remember, uh, this one reverse fixture actually required an Arsenal great escape. 4 3 win, that late, late, late uh, injury time. Declan Rice, uh, emotionally wonderful goal, unless you're a Luton fan. By the way, great comment in the chat. Uh, redhead redemption rog i'll never understand the fortitude it takes to root against luton more than twice a year they're the closest i've ever seen to a team of golden retriever puppies god bless um ross barkley's a bit more shelter pit bull and i love shells of pit bulls um but god bless luton did dug in impressively back five soaking up arsenal's pressure ross barkley coiled to break on the counter uh, 24th minute, self-destruction. Emil Smith-Rowe led the high press. And Panzu coughed up the ball. Erdegaard Havertz exchanged passes. And Erdegaard, despite the fact that he spent yesterday morning speaking to me, still had the confidence to lash home uh, with a fine, fine finish. Things would get worse for Luton. Stroke at half-time. Uh, they honestly defended like Haley Van Lith. Smith-Rowe got to the byline and challenged, pulled the ball back to Nelson, and Hashioka desperately flicked the ball into his own net. 2-0 to the Arsenal. Joy, sweet joy. And Raw, the fact that it was Smith-Rowe putting in a shift, I thought, in this game, made it feel like the goal should have honestly counted double joy-wise for Arsenal fans. He's had some journey. Like He's one of the <clears throat> odd turbulent pieces of of like Arsenal sadness trapped almost in in a perspex box of emotion. Yeah, there's been there's obviously been injuries that have that have cost him a lot of, of playing time. And it's not just the injury that you suffer, it's the fact that it takes so long to get back to fitness. And then what he's found basically is that the team kind of moved on without him. And that that's one of those things that happens in football and it is unavoidable. It happens to lots and lots of players and there's no shame in it. It doesn't mean they're bad or they're not good enough. It's just that the team has taken a certain shape in their absence that that leaves no space for, for something that's that's the shape of you, to quote Ed Sheeran. The, and I think that I mean, Smith-Rowe, I think, will leave this summer. I think he probably has to go to a team just a little bit down the pecking order, Villa, possibly 
you know, Manchester United, the someone someone like that to get regular game time and to to find his his groove again. But it is it is slightly bittersweet because he was one of the gems of the academy, and it's not really that he he didn't kick on as hoped. It was that injury stopped yeah. his development. And then by the time he got back, Arsenal were kind of a different thing. Ah, oh, sheep of you. You are always bringing this show back to Ipswich Town uh, in every regard, Rue. And I do commend you for making them the light motif of today's podcast. Um, but it, Emil Smith wrote a delirious footballer. I, mean, I feel for him. He must wake up and be like, one minute it was me and Saka together lying on the field, just gloriously enjoying every second together. Uh, the next, I'm being shipped off to Everton to do cameos like Donny van der Beek. He's got that kind of pallor about him. So to see him thrive and rise again today gave me great, great joy. Sleepy second half, Luton clinging onto the game. Like that fetch grey quarter zip clinging to Rob Edwards' sculpted chest. Flung on former Manchester United man Tahi Chong, 53rd minute. Uh, looked moderately more positive. Uh, made the f- odd foray up without really making any kind of point of it. Highlight from a neutral perspective, Kai Havertz being booked for, for just remarkable simulation uh, after he was savagely fouled by gravity. A um, lot of subs down the stretch. Um, and that was it. Arsenal remain undefeated in 2024, which is remarkable. Remarkable. They've won nine of the last 10 games um, and a top, at least temporarily, till Liverpool play tomorrow. Um, agony for Luton. They had the Premier League's longest ongoing scoring streak before tonight's match. Want to name that because it was remarkable for them to be able to conjure that when everybody wrote them off. First time they've not scored in a long, long time. Big relief for Arsenal. I'm old enough to remember this time last season where City were five points adrift of Arsenal at this stage and then the Gunners just imploded. They extracted a mere 12 points from their final nine games, limping home as City didn't drop a single point. Uh, The games are fast and furious, as you mentioned. City last Sunday, Luton tonight, Brighton on Saturday, Bayern Munich next Tuesday. Tonight they're top, uh, at least till tomorrow. Um, And God bless them. Uh, Brentford, Brighton, rare recurrence, a referee sent to the monitor by VAR, and he rejected the VAR suggestion. Respect to Andy Madley, who refused to give a penalty uh, for Brighton. Wiesa pulling Dunk over at a Brighton corner, but Madley had a good look and ruled that Dunk fouled Wiesa first. Only the second time this season, Raw, that a ref has rejected a review, and I love it. Yeah, it does feel as though the there is a sort of subliminal, uh, subliminal, a subliminal suggestion in the VAR telling the referee to go and have a look that basically makes the referee's mind up for them. It, it's it's saying, we think you've made a mistake. We want you to kind of confess to it in front of 40,000 people. That's that's yeah. what you've got to do. And it is, I think it's really important actually that we, that we kind of, I know De Zerbi's come out and criticised it and made some sarcastic comment about, I'm sure the referee looked really well. But I think it's important that we normalise this idea that referees can say, do you know what, I take, I take your point, but no, I think I was right in the first place. Does it does yeah, feel I love like, it. Back it off, feel yeah, like that. A lot of this stuff is subjective, and they're allowed to have their subjective opinions, and that shouldn't be influenced or altered by this very kind of ju- judicious, very kind of prurient, very interferency approach that the VARs tend to have. That VARs have that. There's a big, like, there's a strong backseat driver vibe about the VAR, and oh. I think it's really important that the the refs remember that they're the ones who are gripping the whip. Far is the ultimate in law is the way you describe it. Right. But by the way, congratulations. That was the first time the word prurient has ever been used <laughs> on the Men in Blazers Media Network podcast, which is really, wow, raw. It's uh, up there with the Florida Cup. Uh, in other games last night, West Ham won, Tottenham won. Brennan Johnson scored a very Brennan Johnson goal from close range. Zuma equalised off a set piece, actually off his back. Uh, Moyes ball, frustration for Ange, who spent a lot of the game agonising on the sidelines. Team created plenty, but lacked a cutting edge again. Burnley won. Wolves won. Burnley continue to craft great goals filled with hope and then concede sloppily with shattered hope. I think our friend JJ Watt has been to four games on his recent vacation. Um... And he didn't see Burnley lose once, which is remarkable. I texted him today to find out if he'll be at Goodison Park on Saturday. I'm very relieved to know JJ's on a flight home. He won't be there. Come on, lads. Bournemouth beat Palace 1-0. 
winning their fourth game in five, lifting them to 11, thanks to a composed Justin Cliver finish. Almost like he's the son of a Dutch footballing legend or something. Nottingham Forest three, Fulham one, joy and relief across the city ground. Forest have clawed back the four points they've been deducted inside two games. Morgan Gibbs-White, just unplayable. There's a goal, Morgan Gibbs-White to Callum Hudson-Odoi. Six names, one fantastic strike. Rory, is a points deduction bounce the new new manager bounce? Yeah, yeah well, it's, it does seem to have had that effect on both Everton and Forest, <laughs> doesn't it? That, that if you take points off off teams, they, they suddenly think, well, do you know what, we better get these back pretty quickly. Give us another. Give us another. The, the, well, I mean, I mean, careful what you wish, what you wish for, Rog. The, um, the, yeah, I think it was really important for Forest. I think they, they, Forest were sleepwalking into into real trouble. When to be honest, they shouldn't be anywhere near the relegation zone. They've got obviously a massive squad, but also they've got loads of good players. They've got a, you know an experienced. They had they had a good manager. They've now got a really experienced manager. They they should be fine. I'm not quite sure how it had got quite so bad, but. They, I think that was the the best they've played certainly at home for quite some time, and it should give them a little bit of encouragement that that there are you know they only need two or three more games, two or three more wins, and they they should be okay. That should be easily within reach for Forest. Oh, Chris Wood, by the way, a stealth elite wonder. Uh, if he was not from New Zealand, we would be singing ballads about some of these finishes. But a highlight, undoubtedly, Matt Turner getting a yellow card for chirping from the bench. Respect to Americans. Finding a way to impact the game, even when they're not playing. Uh, I like to believe Turner reminded a referee of the life truth. Um, it's a dog fight out there, dog. Uh, referee said, hello to my little friend. Mr. Yellow Card. Newcastle won. Everton won. This is not a drill. Everton won something. Well, don't be stupid, Rod. It wasn't actually a win. It felt like one because we have not won a game in our last 12. Um, but we be- overcame our inner us, which is something. Newcastle <laughs> took the lead. Isaac, ball over the top, just eviscerated our bat line. Watch this goal. He didn't have to do this, but he did it. He wedged Jared Brantwaite. He gave Tarkovsky a wet willy. Um, I think he whipped the underpants off Mikalenko before lashing the ball past Pickford. Everton's response, honestly, totally shambolic. Um, I watched Caitlin Clark in Iowa on Monday night. And I just want to say, my daughter turned around to me. She goes, I didn't know it can be so joyful to watch sports, to watch a team you care about and root for it, and and to see athletes who are good at it and to actually seem to be enjoying it. And I realized, I'm so happy for you, sweetheart. I'm so proud. But also, God, I've done the terrible things in my children. James Garner hit the post. Uh, I talked about Weltschmerz on the last pod, the German literary expression. Um, apathy and self-loathing um, caused by the comparison of the actual state of the world with the ideal state in your mind. At Sound Dave, 1981 said, uh, the Scouse version is called Misery Arse, which I just love. Misery Arse, and the Germans do have a word for it. It all felt like doom. No Premier League win in 12. On came Dominic Calvert-Lewin. Hadn't scored in 23 long games. Essentially an exile from goal scoring. Um, by the way, Sean Dyche did get his subs white for the first time in a long, long time. Andre Gomes came on in exile from football. Um, and there was a mini surge which culminated in a penalty when Paul Dummett did something so awful to Ashley Young, a player who you can do anything to. You can do anything, but he, he strangled him so blatantly. Even VAR had to intercede. Dishel, what must he have gone through his head, Rule? This poor man, not scored in 23 long games. Um, an agony. As he to, to send him up to take the penalty in when he's at the lowest of confidence. Uh, it was by the way, it was a terrible penalty. It went in. Um, but my God, what must have gone through his head in that moment of just agony? Well, it's I mean, it takes real nerve for him to go up and do it. Uh, I suppose that's testament to his um his inner confidence in himself. Uh, it's it's I suppose there's backing from the manager there, isn't it? Saying look, we're not worried about the fact you've not scored since kind of 2023 late 2023 we're gonna you know you you you're still on penalties dominic that is there's a form of confidence in there as well but it must have yeah it must have been a really nerve-wracking experience for him even even if he's the sort of player who doesn't let those you know who doesn't let the misses bother him he does what though. I, he does though what, he is that he i think he is that player i think he is that player the i think he's quite he's quite a thoughtful quite a contemplative sort of person is Dominic Campbell Lewin and I I'm not sure that's necessarily a, a great thing to be when you're a striker on a 
on a bad street. What I like most, though, is that it's 2024. This is we're talking about the Premier League, the, the most sort of glamorous, exciting, richest league in the world. This this endless sort of parade of, of blockbuster events, and there's a game in which both Paul Dummer and Ashley Young, who must be about sixty, were on the pitch <laughs> and decisive. Yes, that's decisive. great. Decisive, decisive. Well done, AARP. Uh, that is what football is all about. By the way, the, maybe the pressure wasn't on DCL because he knew that if he missed, it was only Nathan Patterson that was going to get it. But bloody start playing as good as you smell DCL and everything will be good again. I do love football. I love how many Everton fans are now like, Deitch has got a system worked out now. Dom's back. Watch out. Uh, oh, our next seven, Burnley, Chelsea, Forest, Liverpool, Brentford, Luton, Sheffield United. Uh, I sent that list to my kids today, my youngest son. Uh, wrote back to me immediately. We are winning none of those. Um, but God, we won a big boy point, and I never thought I'd see that again in my lifetime. Chelsea, Manchester United tomorrow. United have had 53 separate injuries or illnesses to senior players already. Latest, Lissandro Martinez, Victor Lindelof out for at least a month with muscle injuries. Very quickly, Raw, I remember when this game, United-Chelsea was the biggest. It was the one that made the world stop. Now it's like the derby of self-inflicted sorry. Yeah, do you know, there was a little bit of a, a conversation on on whatever Twitter's called now about kind of Liverpool-Man City and, and to what extent it counts as a true rivalry. I think one of the British pundits had said something about it being the kind of the biggest Premier League rivalry. And someone said that United-Chelsea is kind of overlooked in terms of how intense it was. In that, in that period between Mourinho arriving and Ferguson leaving, so 2004 to 2013, Chelsea United was the the red letter fixture. They that were the it. two kind of Premier League terrible giants. Terrible to watch. Like, terrible to yeah. watch. Always, always it won all, one. Just, always oh, ended terrible. one one. But it was a really big game. There was <laughs> there were United United were the, the the powerhouses obviously, and Chelsea were kind of the usurpers. And it does feel it's got that weird echo now of you feel like this is a game between two of the big six, so it's massive. But then you look at what both teams have become over the last two or three years, and look, it's not that long since Chelsea were European champions, but. It, it does feel like a, a complete irrelevance. And United, I think, will change manager in the summer and that might lead... To, there's a structure being put in place by Ineos and it looks like there's, there's signs of kind of forward movement at United for the first time in a long time. Chelsea still look a mess. I don't know where they... I don't expect either of those teams to challenge for the title next season. And this game is... It's it's a kind of theatre of memory, isn't it? It's That's what they're playing. They're, it's a ghost of what a rivalry once was. Oh, question from Jacob Kovalashot. Excuse me if I just butchered that last name. You are a beautiful man. You sound like a uh, man who played alongside Kazimir Dana in the great 1978 Polish team. Uh, and I said I would love and respect your question. Tarkovsky almost scored an own goal. Are the Everton players actively working towards relegation? I did think that when Sean Dyche put um, Seamus Coleman on for the last like four minutes of the game. I was like, Sean, do you not watch your own team's game film? Do you not know what what Sheamus does? Um, God bless. We somehow there were nine minutes of uh, added time, and I just um, it was just had Everton conceding in the eighth minute of added time all over it. We survived. We dance. Um, one last note before you take your question. Shout out to Alex Morgan and Lindsay Haran who made an impromptu statement at this morning's United States She Believes press conference to announce that there have been, quote, internal discussions about Corbyn Albert's social media um, and that, quote, standards were not upheld within the team. Really important statement, hard to make, brief in nature, but I think it's their way of signaling uh, that the locker room culture of focus and togetherness will not bear this kind of hate. Um, well done to them for not staying silent. Um, which is really difficult um, in a national team setting to better days for all. Um, to your questions, a reminder of how this works here on YouTube Live. You just have to scan the QR code in the top left of your screen. Uh, I hate QR codes too. You can also just click the pin comment in the chat. Uh, I had to order in an in a airport restaurant with a QR code today. And it just a few things reduced me to more sheer levels of incompetence. Uh, but I'll take you into a Zoom with our producer, uh, the mighty Jake, who can tell you everything you need to know. Don't worry, you won't appear on screen. For those of you who don't want to ask a question, smash that like button. But let's start with Loot Lagraf. Come on up, tell us where you are, double L, uh, and what's your question? 
Hey, Rog and uh, Rory. I'm uh, down in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Oh, um, beautiful. It is. It is a beautiful. It's a great day. It's actually very English. It's sunny and rainy out right now. Um, Sounds half my English. Question, <laughs> <laughs> my uh, question is very um, involved, <laughs> but it's got uh, pertinence. How do we win the? How did the U.S. men win the World Cup? You've asked this yourself, Roger, many times. Win the World Cup before we all, you know, burn up in the sun. Um, I am an uncle. I've got a, this interesting situation where my brother is going to be coaching an under eight year old with his with his son. So I'm I, I sent him a Pep Guardiola article, and and it's it, about playing. You know, having uh, Victor Valdez in goal, all eleven players being able to pass it. You know, and he sent back may try this tomorrow, spreading them to the end lines to pass around the blob in the middle. Uh, you y'all have kids. I don't. How can I help? How can I? What can we do? Yeah, so Lou Legraff, you're asking two questions. I want to know which one you're asking of the great rule. Are you talking about at the youth development level, or are you asking like how do we win the World Cup in our lifetime at, with our like what changes do we need to make in the in the here and now? Yeah, I'm asking what we can do for the kids because I'm gonna I'm I have the situation where I can actually influence i play soccer i can influence some kids with my, with my brother and eventually i know you know we're probably not going to win it for a while but how do, how do we eventually do it by starting now oh god bless i love this question my short answer well two of them would be uh to win the world cup the united states just have to start playing uh, half as well in real life as they do in my dreams but the second answer is just purchase expected goals, Rory's book for your brother and have him implement all of those methods that Rory Smith prescribes. And I think we'll oh, see an uptick in, in uh, probably, I, I don't, I'll give you a money back guarantee. If the United <laughs> States does not improve uh, at the under eight level by 72% within 11 months of you purchasing that book, I will give you your money back. But Rory, <laughs> what do you think? I mean, is, is, do you have yeah. an answer? Not, not, not like a comprehensive one. No, I think. Well, Redhead Redemption said in the in the chat that pay for play is a problem, and I think that's true. That you need to win the World Cup. The big thing that the US has is there's an awful lot of people there, and the more people who play, the more likely you are to find the twenty six talented individuals who you would need to to win that tournament. It's the same. It is to an extent a numbers game. Um, I think in terms of what you what Luke can do. As a coach, as a as an assistant coach to his brother, um, which is an uneasy relationship, and I hope it goes okay. The uh, I think is you, th what we're seeing in Europe is that this rise of the rapid rise of if you teach kids technical football at a young age, you you kind of expand the the horizons for their skill levels exponentially. That you yes, know, it, if you look at the best example actually is in the women's game that. If you, I was in Barcelona about a month ago to do a, a story that will come out at some point about um, about how that Catalonia has kind of become the world capital of women's soccer, and you have this incredible team, Barça Femini, who are, I think they've played twenty one, one twenty in Spain this season. They'll be champions again. They'll, they'll probably win the Champions League again. They are this unstoppable force. The last three Ballons d'Or are Barça players, but you go out into Catalonia, and there are so many girls playing football. And there's been this transformation in the numbers that they've got. The crucial thing is that they are all, they've are they all got access to high-quality coaching. And I think what you'll see in, in Barcelona and in Spain in the next 5, 10, 15 years is just this endless parade of technically brilliant footballers being produced because they've got the numbers into the system that works. Yeah. I, I don't know the US system well enough to know, but I think that if you don't have... The, the coaches in co coaches encouraging kids to do things like take risks, to build possession from the back, to play through the thirds, as everyone says now, to to kind of make those brave choices, those courageous decisions. You don't get players who are comfortable on the ball, who can make, who have the technical level to finish like Phil Foden, who can do all the things that can kind of maximise their talent. So as a coach, I'd say, just encourage the kids to take risks and express themselves. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd say three very quick things um, in all seriousness. Um, and whoever said the pay-to-play system um, is killing football here, 
uh, that there's many ways it's very destructive. It prices a lot of natural talent out. Football is really shout out to Redhead Redemption, uh, who I think you said that. Um, the prices a lot of uh, uh, of young footballers out of the game, and football is at its heart. I mean, you can you can name the number of um, you can name the number of elite um, footballers. Who are working? Who are um, middle class on mm. on, on one? Yeah. And most of the ones that are are uh, other than like um, Kaka um, or Perlo, who are like kids of industrialists or uh, business human beings. So they're, they're normally footballers' kids, like Lampard. Um, but like genuinely, it's a game of the streets. It's a game of the working class. Uh, so pay to play prevents that from occurring. And then secondly. Uh, pay to play stops that because um, you you, you want to win. And most American dads and mums don't know that much about football. So which program do they want their kids in? The one that wins games. Ultimately, youth development is not about winning. Yeah. Um, it's really not. You like I, I, I interviewed the Barcelona coach who, who brought to Iniesta and Xavi, and he said, you know, when they were young, we didn't win a lot of games. Um, but like, you can't just throw the big kids in to plow over. Uh, young talent to win games. He's like, let them lose the games, but let them grow and develop. And that's why ultimately America was very good for a long time at uh, developing athletic big units, but not really nuanced ball carriers. Second thing is more street play. There's almost overcoaching in the United States. And if your kid uh, is interested in football and, and is listening, ask yourself, how much do they actually play on their own? How much are they playing in coaching environments? It's almost like we overcoach here. You don't allow a true joy uh, for the game, like a true close ball control, just coming from playing in the street or in the park as you do in other parts of the world. Um, and then Rory hit the other big point. The coaching is still self-admittedly. We did a series on this for Allstate uh, about six months ago, a three-part series about what will it take to develop an American, truly great world-class outfield player. Um, we had a lot of people speak to that issue, including... Um, uh, I mean, you can find this series. I can't remember the name of it. It was beautiful too. The Ar Aronson's dad, a guy who's produced two very good footballers. It was fascinating listening to him talk about it. Uh, but we did a whole deep dive into this. Go and find that. Listen to it with your brother. Let's pray for better coaching. By the way, on the women's side as well as the men's, um, I do believe we can win the World Cup in our um, in our lifetime. But the other thing is fans, we've got to stop just overhyping everything. The number of players who are like, number of fans who are like, Cavan Sullivan's going to take us uh, to the promised land in 2040. Um, we've just got to deep breath everything. Um, next up, it's our resident Arsenal optimist. It's Joshua Youngerman. I don't have to be optimistic. We're in first place. <laughs> Oh, mate, is that what you came on to say? Because that's just perfect. You're beautiful. You're beautiful. By the way, <laughs> I, go on. Well, I was just, I was going to ask, Raj, uh, as sort of the resident dyspeptic uh, sports fan, because you're also a fan of the White Sox, and they're already worthless. Um, oh, my God. But oh, my God. Yeah. At the, at, at, so you don't have anything to get you through April and May like I do. Um, but ethically and morally, right? Um, don't Luton Town deserve to stay up? Just the mm. ethical and moral, moral dilemma, right? They deserve to stay up, right? I don't understand the question. If this is like uh, Pochettino yeah, I mean, saying on data, Chelsea are fourth. Are you talking about the morality league? Are you talking about the ethical and morality league? Should we be rooting for Luton Town? Should I, we be rooting for I, Luton Town to stay up? I understand this question. On several different levels, Rog, and I think it's a great question. I think is it, yes, is the is Premier League is the Premier League now we're forgetting points? We're just going by karma and good vibes. Is that how we're judging it? I would fully back the. So this this is a reference that probably won't work, but in rugby, which is a yeah. sort of stupid sport that we play in in Europe, in, in not even in Europe, just in Britain and Australia, um, they you get an extra point if you if you store a certain number of points, you get an extra point. So if you start, I think it's five or six tries, you get a, you don't just get three points for a win, you get a fourth point or a fifth point or something for 
a bonus point for for being entertaining. I would back the introduction of bonus points for moral purity in the Premier League. I think that would be great. And in that in in that situation, Luton Town would get any number of points and possibly even be like in the Champions League because they are the story is is remarkable. And yeah, we should. If you don't have a dodge in the fight, you should want Luton to stay up. Absolutely. I'm, I'm not sure what you're asking. You're asking why do terrible things happen to good people? Is that the, is that the question you're asking? Are you asking why do bad things happen if God loves us? Both of those questions. No, no, no. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just saying. Well, yeah, all, all of those questions, all of the above. But also, I'm just saying. You know, if I want to be an ethical and moral person, right? I want to be a good human being, Roger. Yeah. Shouldn't I be rooting for Luton Town? Stay up over. Well, I, I won't even get to. Um, I won't get to the the points deduction, but you know, just the yeah. football. Like, look, they they were not good today, but they had such spirit and fight that I was scared shitless until the the ninety fourth minute that something was going to happen. Uh, I love. By the way, I love this. That there should be points additions. The football league should be who've been very focused on the points deductions. There should be a different yeah. committee, like an a group of angels who uh, like you have that devil side who are just like let's take points off those bastards. And then there's another group, another oh, just who play harps and sew and just play the harpsichord, and they'll give points additions, like the central bank just hike the interest rates, maybe. just like an extra point for the best away kit. That's a really good idea. That's just like at some point in November, someone gets an extra point for having a great away kit. Oh, or, or the manager who smells the best. I think yeah, this is very 100%. interesting. I, by yeah, the way, yeah. the MLS could do this to keep the end of season games more interesting. I think MLS is probably, it sounds like Rock and Jot, the old MTV celebrity uh, uh, softball contest where they just seem to make up the rules. Look, I believe in order. I don't believe in chaos. I'm not sure I'm an ethical person, Joshua. I do. I'm, I kind of live like, Grouch, was it Groucho Marx who said, these are my principles. If you don't like them, I have others to show you. Um, I do know that Everton, if they do survive, um, I mean, it's one of the, in all seriousness, it's not a great time to be an Everton fan. If they do survive, you know, there's a feeling that there's darkness around the corner. Uh, there's darkness that have got us here. The owners have done terrible things. Uh, with the club to get them into this state, 777 or so. Every report, uh, every not just report, but the financial uh, bodies who are just reviewing them in the most negative uh, financial way, the fact that they're being taken seriously shows that they are like Everton's best and only uh, future. It's out of the uh, fire into, uh, out of the frying pan into the fire situation for Everton Football Club. There's a lot of darkness. So the, being an Everton fan, you, you do feel a sense of, oh my God, we are a terrible club. The thing that brings me joy about Everton is the fans. The fans are incredible. You see those fans who travel to Newcastle on a Tuesday night up there, thousands of them singing along, supporting this team. And I think, when I think about it, I think the ownership has been quite awful and done terrible things, reckless things with this club. Do we deserve to stay because of it? You know, I mean, if we go down, it will be by our own hand. But I think about the fans, I think about the people who work at the club who are incredible. Uh, I think about the work that the club does in the community, which is incredible. Um, and then we're ultimately, like Primo Levi wrote, they're all human beings. There's not black and white, uh, but we all live in the gray zone. So I'd answer that. Your question, you're asking me, ethically, morally, I think every football club is in the grey zone, and then I don't know how we judge. I don't know how we judge. So let's just let the points decide, and please, God, Everton will stay up because I will be so bloody lost without them. I love this question, Joshua Youngerman. Is that what you were hinting me towards, that I, I should just morally uh, wish Everton are uh, relegated? No, no, no. I mean, like, look, I morally wish the Whites, honestly, it would might act, of course, the White Sox to act if they were relegated, like, let's say. I'm a third White Sox fan, you know? But um, no, I am more just impressed by like the spirit that Luton Town has. I agree. And like I said, like I was genuinely scared today in the 90th minute that they would get two goals. That's and that's, that's, they were, and like, that, brilliant, that's what's. But they have such spirit and fight. And what's been amazing about Luton this season is when in their first few games they did look like they were kind of hopelessly out of their depth. That you looked at them and thought, this is an amazing story that this team that that has been to the brink, that had a 30-point deduction that sent it out of the Football League, 
that that basically you know was within a few a few minutes of ceasing to exist. They've had this wonderful rise to the Premier League, but now like you know this is big boy football and this is all kind of too much. And what's been really impressive is they they have learned. It's been a journey of watching them discover the things you need to do. And I think if the season went on for another eight games, they'd probably stay up. Not necessarily at Everton's expense, but they probably would find the points to stay up. I think as it is, they'll probably run out of road. Stop the, the count. Everything they've done deserves huge credit. They they have added a huge amount to the lead, I think. And the other thing is that what it means to that place, Luton is Luton's like an hour out, outside of London, but it is refused to gentrify. There is nowhere in that like radius of London where that hasn't been affected by the fact that you've got this huge financial global financial capital in the middle of it everywhere is massively expensive people can't afford to live there there's you know you can get a a cortado wherever you like it's this kind of there's farmers markets everything's artisanal it's happened to all these little (laughs) towns that as far north as like rugby which no one in britain would tell you is anywhere near london but is now commuter belt because london sort of exerts this gravity luton is still resolutely luton and the team has given this place that is only ever really in the news for bad reasons, this huge reason to be proud. And that to a place like Luton, which to most of the country is, it's where Andrew, Andrew Tate is from. It's home or it's got a link to Tommy Robinson, who's a, a far right leader here. It's And it's got the worst airport potentially in Britain, which is saying something by the standards <laughs> of British airports. The, I was just going to say the, that. I was just going to say that. <laughs> Suddenly, the way that people are kind of encountering Luton now is through this incredible football team that's telling this amazing story. And, and that, it's delirious. that means so much. It is. By the way, you throw in Ross Barkley, a human redemption story that gives me great joy. Um, I do think Luton fans should start chatting, Rory. You can stick your catardos up your ass. That I would love to live and see. I mean, ultimately, it's joyous, Joshua Younger, and I love football. You know, I'm fascinated by Brighton, teams that prove, like Luton have this season, that football is not just about balance sheets. I'd like to believe that, and Luton do give you a glimpse that that's possible. Brighton definitely give you a a glimpse that that's possible. Um, And um, and God bless. Yes, I will say it. We will be all the better uh, if Luton stay up, uh, which means I'm sorry, Nottingham Forest. Um, <laughs> we are almost on time, but I do want to ask another Arsenal question very quickly because it's a great one from chat of you, Roar, very, very quickly. Gage Wheeler asks, are Saliba and Gabriel the best centre-back pairing in the Premier League? And I'll add to that uh, something we both know, which is the Alex Ferguson quote, um, goals win your games, defences win your championship." Saliba and Gabriel are the best centre-back pairing in the Premier League. Yes. I'd, I'd love to expand on that, but yeah, they are. They are. Give they, us, that's, you, you give us a tiny bit more. That, I mean, that, it's, ultimately, it's, their, it's their more talk. Uh, and, uh, I mean, and I, I suppose the, the, the flip side would be you'd say that you couldn't really say Man City play with a centre-back partnership because of the, the way Pep structures the team. So it's, it feels like a slightly unfair comparison. But I think Saliba and Gabriel, they, they cover each other's weaknesses. They kind of it accentuate each other's strengths. They have been central to everything Arsenal have done. For all that Arsenal play wonderful football, the fact that they are currently top of the Premier League is down in no small part one, to Saliba and Gabriel being the best defensive partnership in the league. Two, to the, the work of their set-piece coach, Nicholas Jova. And three, to the fact that they've got a, a, like a feel-good dog at the training ground. Those are the three key win, factors. Win the dog win is the dog. his name. And by win the way, the I've, I've, I've suddenly analysed how uh, these clever corners are done. Essentially, it's just they just launch Ben White at the goalkeeper. They just fling him like he's a carcass being flung out of a catapult in the medieval days. I would love to go on because I just adore listening to you, great Rory Smith and you GFOPs, but barbecue does not eat itself. Uh, we've just got a question from Carol Swift in Glendale, Arizona. Rog excited for She Believes to see which players state their claim to be on Emma Hayes' Olympic roster. Who are you looking out for there? Um, for that one, Carol Swift, go to the women's game. Sam Ewis and I just taped a full preview of all the four teams in the She Believes. We did obviously go in deep on the US Wonder. I am so excited that Lily Johannes, the 16-year-old Wonder for my ex, is riding with us. And I cannot wait, please, please, God, uh, to see her play in a US jersey. What a remarkable human story she is uh, and her family. 
reminder of everything coming up for the rest of the week. All of it brought to you by Michelob Ultra, Superior Light Beer. Uh, I had one of those for lunch with my brisket. Yes, we want to give a shout out today to the crew at Men in Blazers Early Kickoff, our daily podcast, which brings football's biggest headlines into your pod feed in 10 minutes or less. Go and subscribe right now. Every single bloody morning, if you wake up and say, what's happened in the football world in the last 24 hours, this is the show for you. Men in Blazers Early Kickoff. Off. Search that to its own feed wherever you get your podcast. I love it. It's my favorite podcast in the world. Uh, we'll be back Friday with a brand new episode of WGFOP. Call in your last minute questions at 646 450 9472. 646 450 9472. And did I mention I've just spoken to Ruben Diash and Martin Erdegaard? For two really beautiful interviews, I've only mentioned it 87 times. Those will be dropping right here on our YouTube uh, in the next couple of days. Subscribe to make sure you're notified. Subscribe now. Come be with us. Do not miss it. I'm also doing a Do It Live right after the first She Believes game with the great Sam Mewis on the Women's Game YouTube. Lots and lots of stuff. Um, we will be back. Rory Smith, I've really bloody enjoyed listening to you tonight, you king. It's been a lovely, having a lovely time. Thank you for having me. Covered a lot of ground, man. You are like the, we have, yeah. you're, you're like the Rodri of uh, of podcasts. I mean, yeah. we've covered, we've covered a lot, a lot, a lot. One of these days, we're going to get your dad on this show. That's all I'm going to ask for. I'm going to get your dad and Tim Howard on this show. I'm going to get a an elite <laughs> goalkeeper and your father, and we'll talk about walls. We can I, go. A I, lot. I don't know if YouTube's ready for my dad. <laughs> <laughs> Although at the same time, maybe my dad is perfect for YouTube. It would be a sort of late in life career switch. Oh for my God. Yeah, he's got, it's going to be, oh God. I mean, but I tell you, I think your dad's ready. I think he's ready. Um, I love being with you. We'll be back on Friday until then, GFOPs, as they say in North Carolina, courage.